Good morning. We are so grateful that you have decided today to join us in worship here at First Baptist Church, Mooresville. It is our highest honor that you are here, but we want to get you connected with our church and serving God more faithfully. So this morning on your way out, we encourage you to pick up a hard copy of our messenger. There's so many things in here that you can um, look at and, and find different ways to get connected and involved here at First Baptist Church. If you are a first-time guest or perhaps you have a prayer concern or you want to sign up for Wednesday night supper, uh, we encourage you to fill out the Connect card that is in the pew in front of you, or you can scan the QR code that you'll find there on your worship bulletin. It's just a simple way to let us know more about you and the needs in your life, and we as a staff and as a team would love to be praying for you and serving you in um, any way that we can. But this morning, we have gathered with one purpose in mind, and that is to honor the one true living God. And here at First Baptist Church, we are a place to belong. No matter where you are in your life or your spiritual journey, you can encounter God in a new and fresh way this morning. So let us now prepare our hearts and our minds for worship and what it is that God needs us to hear this day. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. No matter where life takes us, what situations come our way, God remains faithful. It's who he is. He's still on the throne, and he is still intervening on our behalf to bring breakthrough and to bring hope when we are hopeless. And this morning, we gather to worship him, for he is Lord of all. And he wants to remind you today, no matter what you're walking through, no matter your circumstance or how distraught you're feeling, be reminded, but God. And he is the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper. He is light in our darkness. Rain down on us, almighty God, as we stand, as we sing, as we worship him. Press into his presence where two or three are gathered.
that you stand behind us and your presence is all around us. And even when we can't see it or feel it, you're working. And you tell us in your word, do not fear for I am with you. Don't be dismayed for I am 
are God. Father God, we remember your faithfulness, all your mighty deeds, for you are the God who performs miracles. You are the God who meets every need. Display your power among the people, Lord, for your renown, for your glory. Show us who you are today through the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit. We lift our prayer in one accord and in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from Psalm 55, verses 16 and 17. And it's a wonderful promise for us to claim this day. As for me, I call to God, and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. And this is the word of God. Thanks be to God for his word. Our hymn this morning is also another wonderful promise that as we walk through this life, surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. Let's sing that together. Our New Testament scripture this morning comes from 1 John 
chapter 5, verse 14 through 15. This is the confidence we have approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. To God. Thanks be to God for his word. And in the book of Colossians, the Apostle Paul gives us a beautiful reminder that as we come before God, whether in worship, whether in missions and ministry, or whether now as we come before God in worship, through the giving of our tithes and our offerings, we're to come before God with gratitude in our hearts. And so let me ask you this. What are you thankful for that God is doing in your life? It's so easy to miss the blessings that God is bestowing upon each and every one of us because we know that days can be difficult and long. But let us never forget that God is always working on our behalf and always seeking the best for each and every one of us. And so our challenge now is that our reflection is, a, is that our giving is a reflection of the blessings that God has given us. Would you join with me now as we pray? Lord, we, we come before you now to give of our tithes and our offerings to you. But Lord, as we give, we give in, in response to what you have already given us. For you, O oh God, have given us your son Jesus to save us your Holy Spirit to comfort and strengthen us your church to teach and encourage us and your holy word to guide and to correct us and God we have truly been blessed and so as we give to you now we ask oh God that you would accept these gifts as an expression of our gratitude to you for it's in the name of Christ that we do pray. Amen.
If you have felt the dark of night, questioning what is out of sight, He is the answer. He is the light. If you have felt the weight of sin, bound by the shame that's hemmed you in, He'll break the chains. He will forgive.
it's good to be back here. Um, I'm glad to be down here with my brother Anderson, the executive director of the South Yakin Baptist Association. Um, South Yakin Baptist Association comprised of over 60 churches in Iredell, Davie, and um, Rowan, basically Mooresville, Moxville, Statesville, and surrounding communities. We thank you for your partnership in the association. We thank you for doing your um, Super Bowl collection for us. We really appreciate it because we can do so much more by working together. I also want to be a resource and an encouragement for you guys. So anything I can do to help you, come alongside you. We're here for you at the association. And one thing that's really exciting this year is our 150th anniversary of the, um, of the association. And we're focusing on celebrating the past, embracing the present, and looking forward to the future. And it's our prayer that every one of our churches does the same thing. So that's enough about me. Um, I want to look at um, how we can persevere in prayer. Luke 18, 1 through 8 is going to be our text today. So if you want to turn there, I've got support passages up on the screen, but we'll look at the main text in the Bible. So Luke 18, 1 through 8. But as you turn in there, let me share something with you. One of the most difficult aspects of prayer is persevering when it seems like God is not answering. You know, think about this. Jesus instru instructed us to pray that the Father's kingdom would come, as will be done on earth, as is in heaven. And yet, here we are, almost 2,000 years later, and that prayer does not seem to be answered. In spite of years of prayer and missionary efforts, some of the Muslim, Buddhist, and Hindu sections of the world seem as resistant to the gospel as ever. So it's easy to become discouraged in prayer for world missions. On a personal level, all of us have had requests that we brought before God, requests that would give him glory if he'd answer them. But it seems like God is not answering them. In light of these problems, it's easy to lose hope and even to give up praying. And Jesus knew the weakness of our flesh, that we're prone to lose heart. In light of that, he graciously gave his disciples and us this parable to show us that at all times we ought to pray and not lose heart. During the time between Jesus' ascension and his second coming, the world would go on in its disregard of God, much as it had in the days of Noah and Lot. During this time of waiting and struggle, how can Christians persevere? Jesus shows us today in this parable how we can persevere in prayer. Let's pray. Dear God, I just want to pray as we look at your word today. You'll guide us, you'll lead us. You'll show us what we need to stop doing, what we need to start doing, and what we need to do better. And God, I want to pray your blessings upon this church. God, I want to pray that they can celebrate the past, embrace the present, reach the community right here, and look forward to the future because you're not done here at First Mooresville. And we want to pray your blessings upon Brother Jerry and his Speedy recovery as well, God. So we want to pray all this in your precious son, Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 18, 1 through 8 says this. Then he, he being Jesus, spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying there was a certain city, a judge who did not fear God nor re regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within, within himself, Though I do not fear God, no regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust said. And shall God not avenge his own elect, who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? And I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? There's four points I want to make out of this text. First of all, to become a person of prayer, we need to pray often. We need to pray often. Jesus said we ought to always pray. Keeping our conversation with God all day long is praying often. We need to be in continued communication with God, not just before meals, not just at prayer time. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says this, we are to pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. When the Apostle Paul tells us to pray without ceasing, 
The word he used is the same word that was used for repeated military assaults. The army would attack and withdraw and regroup. Then they would attack again and again until they achieved victory. And that's how we ought to pray. The word also was used of a hacking cough. A person with a hacking cough does not usually cough without coming up for a breath. Rather, they coughed often and repeatedly. That's how we should be about prayer. We need to be constantly in prayer with God. Constant communication. But sometimes we need to stop and just pray for a specific request, for a specific burden, or just pray and give him the praise that he deserves. In times of great need, we need to set aside longer times to devote ourselves to prayer. If you have a big decision coming up, spend more time in prayer. We ought to pray, is what Jesus says. Romans 12, 12 says this. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continually, steadfastly in prayer. See, re real prayer takes effort. It takes effort. Do you ever notice when you get on your knees to pray, your mind starts wandering? Does that ever happen to you? Or the phone rings. The baby starts crying. The kids start fighting. Or someone comes to the door. The reason for this is the flesh and the devil, they hate it when Christians get on their knees to do serious business with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In Ephesians 6, is where Paul, the apostle, lists the armor of God that the Christian is to put on to stand against the wiles of the devil. And at the very end, Paul instructs us in Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Prayer, along with the Word of God. This is what Paul tells us is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Prayer and the Word are our weapons in spiritual warfare. We need to use them. And if we're going to accomplish anything for God, we need to bathe it in prayer. Whether it be witnessing, teaching, preaching, singing, studying the Bible, whatever we do, we need to bathe it in prayer. God speaks to us through our prayers. Oswald Sanders said this. He said, Jesus prayed in the morning at the gateway of the day, in the evening when the workday was over. Great crises were preceded by prayer. Great achievements were preceded by prayer. Great achievements were followed by prayer. Great pressure of work was a call to extra prayer. Great sorrows was met by prayer. He died praying. Prayer is a habit we need to cultivate. And it's a presence we need to enjoy. We need to work on our prayer life. I don't know anybody that's got, that, that says, oh, I got it all under control. My prayer life is good. No, we need to constantly work on it. Jesus says we ought to pray. The word ought has the idea of the necessity. Prayer is not an optional activity for the more committed. Oh, he's a stronger Christian. He needs to pray. The, the weaker Christian needs prayer even more. We all need to be pray, prayer warriors. We need to work on our prayers. Because what prayer does, when you go to God, you're saying, I need you. I'm dependent on you. Think about the arrogance we have when we say, oh, I can handle this myself. I don't need to talk to God. No. We need to be in communication with God. I remember seeing... Um, Jeff Org preached at this conference. Jeff Org is the president of Gateway Seminary. And this was my take home from a two and a half day conference. He says he prays for two things wisdom and discernment. And the other one is, Lord, here we go. When I'm going up to preach, when I'm going to the board meeting, he prays, Lord, here we go. And it's a reminder that he's not going by himself. We need to be people of prayer. So, how often do you pray? Is it something we need to work on? To become a person of prayer, we need to pray often. And then, we, number two, we need to not become discouraged in our prayers. 
You must expect God to answer your prayers. In James 1, we're told that when we pray for wisdom, God will give it generously. Then James adds a powerful warning about letting doubt creep in your prayers. James 1, 6 through 7, says this. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not the man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Now compare that to the positive that we find in 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Now this is a confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have, we have the petitions that we have asked of him. We need to pray positively without doubting. Sadly, many Christians pray, but they don't really expect an answer. I heard about a Sunday school teacher who had, a children, had the children write letters to, the, to a missionary that they had been praying for. The teacher explained that the missionary was very busy and would not have time to send a reply to every child, so they should not expect to hear back from him. And one little boy wrote this letter. He said, Dear Mr. Smith, I'm praying for you. I'm not expecting an answer. How often are we like that? How often do we pray to God, but not, we're not really expecting an answer? I've known people who have quit praying because they didn't seem to get an answer. Think about this. If I walk into a room and I flip on a light switch, I expect a light to come on. If it does not come on, I don't curse Thomas Edison and say electricity is a lie. I start looking for the problem. Maybe the light bulb was burned out. Maybe a breaker's been tripped. Or maybe the power is out. If it seems that your prayers are not answered, don't quit praying. Start looking for the reason. It might be the wrong request. Or you might have unconfessed sin in your life. Or the timing might not be right. See, God answers prayer. He answers prayer in different ways. Often, his answer is yes, no, or wait. And we often lose heart in prayer when God delays his answers. In the context of this parable, the source of discouragement that Jesus, that's the source of this discouragement that Jesus is addressing he knew that his coming back was going to be delayed to the point the disciples would not see him come back. He was not going to come back in their lifetime. Luke 17, 22 says this, Then he said to the disciples, The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And during his absence, the disciples would be mocked and rejected, just as Noah and Lot were. Luke 17, 26 through 30. And it was in the days of Noah, so it would also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they, brought, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out and out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will be in the days when the Son of Man is revealed. Some of these disciples were going to be persecuted to the point of death. Others hearing this were going to go through awful hardships. And he knew that from a limited perspective, it often seems that God is not answering or even listening when we pray because we do not see things from his eternal perspective. And so he told this parable to show us that we ought to pray and not lose hearts. Cable television tycoon Ted Turner was often quoted as being critical of Christianity. Turner made some very revealing marks at a banquet in Orlando, Florida in 1990 when he was given an award by the American Humanist Association for his work on behalf of the environment. Turner said he had a strict grew up in a strict Christian up home, and at one time considered becoming a missionary. But he said he became disheartened with Christianity after his sister died, despite his prayers. God does not always answer prayers the way we want him to. 
And probably every one of us has considered giving up on seeing some of our our prayers answered. Probably more than just a few of us have given up and stopped praying, maybe not altogether, but have quit praying for certain things. We get, quit praying because of discouragement and doubt. We quit praying because deep down we sometimes wonder if our prayer even makes a difference. So how do we keep going when we feel like quitting? So to become a person of prayer, we need to pray often, not to become discouraged in our prayers, and become persistent in our prayers. So Jesus tells this parable. And a parable is basically an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Or another way to look at it, He's using a sermon illustration. And the story of the widow, she keeps coming to the judge with her petition. And she keeps coming and coming and asking and asking. The lady had an adversary. And we're not given any other details, but she had a problem. And she would not be satisfied until the judge heard her request and took care of her problem. She wasn't going to be denied. See, the most effective prayers in the Bible are those that are prayed persistently. David wrote this in Psalm 55, 16 through 17. He says, As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. David was always calling upon the Lord. In the Old Testament, we read about Hannah, how she desperately desperately wanted a child for many years she prayed and prayed to have a child and her prayer was unanswered for years and she didn't say well it must not be God's will for me to have a child she kept on praying and God gave her a son who was Samuel the mighty prophet even Jesus prayed persistently on the night before the crucifixion he was in the garden of Gethsemane pouring out his heart to the father His prayer burden was so intense, there were drops of blood like sweat from his forehead. He prayed, Father, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. He prayed it again and again. Three times he cried out to the Father, and his Father heard him and gave him the strength and resolve to face the cross. Paul had some kind of painful affliction called a thorn in the flesh we can read about in the Bible. He begged the Lord to remove the pain. He asked not once, not twice, but three times before the Lord answered. And when God answered, it was not the prayer, or it was not the answer that Paul was looking for. God did not take away the thorn. Instead, he gave him the grace to cope with the pain. So Paul began to give God glory in the midst of his pain. Persistence is an important factor in prayer. But persistence is a valuable commodity for every area of Christian life, not just prayer. God blesses those who persist. So whatever you may be facing right now, don't give up. Don't give up. Galatians 6, 9 says this. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Donald S. Whitney says, Failure to persist in prayer proves that we are not too serious in the first place. Persistence in prayer demonstrates great faith. In this society where this parable takes place, widows were especially at risk. They didn't have many opportunities to make money. They didn't have life insurance. It didn't exist at the time. She was dependent on whatever her husband had left her. But somehow an adversary had cheated her out of what she had to live on. So when she comes to the judge and asks for justice, he takes one look at her and he figures, she's not going to give me much of a bribe. And I've got so many others who I can reward handsomely if I take their cases. So he refuses to give her any help. But every day he tells her to get lost, she keeps coming back. He cannot get rid of her. She's beginning to dominate his life. He begins to hate going to work because he's going to be confronted by this nagging woman. Finally, after weeks of going on like this, he says to himself, even though I do not fear God, I do not care about this woman, I'm going to grant her request just to get her off my back. Jesus says, hear what the unrighteous judge said. There's a lesson to be learned from this situation about persevering in prayer when God seems to delay the answer. George Mueller, 
I shared an illustration about him last time I was here. He was the founder of a great Christian orphanage in England in the 1800s. And he was a powerful man of prayer. He knew the importance of keeping prayer even when the answer seemed delayed. When he was young, he began to pray that two of his friends might be saved. He prayed for them for over 60 years. One of the men was converted shortly before his death. It was, was probably the last service Mueller held. The other was saved within a year of his death. What do you think would happen to these guys if Mueller had given up on his prayer? We must be persistent in our prayers. Think about this. Are you persistent in your prayers? Have you given up? So to become a person of prayer, we need to pray often, not to become discouraged in our prayers, become persistent in our prayers, and finally, we need to remember who it is we're asking to answer our prayers. Warren Wiersbe says of the widow in the parable, he said, that woman had no friend at court to help her case get on the docket. All she could do was walk outside the tent and make a nuisance of herself as she shouted at the judge, but when Christian believers pray with persistence, they have a Savior who is their advocate, their high priest, who constantly represents them before the throne of God. Romans 8.34 says this, Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore more is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. He's our advocate. So the judge here in this parable is not like God. This judge neither feared God nor respected man. And that script description was used in ancient literature to describe the most wicked and rebellious people. This man, this judge, was immoral. God is compassionate and righteous. Now this widow is not like us because as a believer we're a child of God. If the judge granted the request of the widow, how much more will God grant the request of his children? Jesus said this in Matthew 7, 7 and following. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who receives, for everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? Now, God does not always answer prayers the way we want him to, to answer them. Sometimes we do not get what we ask from God because he's got something better in store for us. One day, a dad took his son to the Western Auto hardware store, and near the front of the store, there were new handlebar grips for sale. They were plastic, and they had long streamers hanging from the ends. He said, Daddy, Daddy, I've just got to have these handlebar grips. Please, Daddy. And his dad looked at him and said, No, son, you don't need those grips. Now come with me to the back of the store. And as he followed his dad, the boy was bitter and frustrated. Under his breath, he was muttering, I never get anything. It's just a lousy $3. My dad sure is mean. When they got to the back of the store, the owner wheeled out a shiny brand new bike, complete with handlebar grips with plastic streamers. The dad said, here, son, it's an early birthday present. I would not buy you the hand handlebar grips because I ordered you a new bike. And the boy was ecstatic. As he wheeled his new bike out the front door, he never gave those handlebar grips at the front a second look. Sometimes when we ask God for something, he has something better in store for you. And God may answer your prayer no, but that's still an answer to prayer. Don't ever stop praying until you hear God say no. At that point, Stop making that request and start praying in a different way. I remember when my dad was dying with cancer, I was praying that God would heal him. And God told me, no, he wasn't going to heal him. So I started praying that my dad wouldn't suffer much and he would go home quickly to Jesus. 
And God answered that prayer. C.S. Lewis wrote this. He said, prayer is a request. And the end, essence of a request as distinct from, is distinct from a demand in that it may or may not be granted. So if an infinitely wise being listens to the request of finite and foolish creatures, of course, he will sometimes grant them and sometimes refuse them. If God had granted every silly prayer that I've ever made in my life, where would I be right now? So think about this. When we rely on an organization, we're going to get what the organization can do. When we rely on government, we're going to do what government can do. When we rely on schools, we'll get what education can do. And we rely on prayer, we will get what God can do. So who are you relying on? When he's outside agencies yourself, or the king of king and lord of lords. So um, let me conclude with this. To become a person of prayer, we need to pray often. In a few minutes, I'm going to pray. And if you want to respond to the message, either in your seat or come to the altar. Maybe you need to commit to praying often, praying more, to being a person of prayer. It takes time, it takes discipline, it takes practice. Don't become discouraged in prayer. If you're discouraged, give it to God. Let him encourage you. The more you do it, the easier it gets. Become persistent in your prayers. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep praying until you get an answer. And finally, remember who it is who is answering your prayers, who it is. It's God. God spoke the heavens and the earth into existence. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. If he can do that, how hard? walk with him. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, my plea is that you'll do so today. The Bible says we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. All of us sin and fall short. That's why God sent his son Jesus Christ to die on that cross to pay a penalty that we couldn't pay so that we can have a relationship we have to do our part. We need to believe and confess. And if you've never do, done that, my plea today is that you'll come forward and do that today. Let's pray. Dear God, I just want to pray as we get to the end of the service that we can be sold out followers of Jesus Christ, that we can be persistent in our prayers, that we can be prayer warriors, that we can realize that prayer is so important it's how we get our marching orders from you, God. So let us be people of prayer, God. And I want to pray. If there's somebody here that's never totally surrendered to you, they'll do so today, God. And I want to pray your blessings upon this church. That this church we fill with a bunch of prayer warriors willing to get out into this community and reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. <coughs> and we pray all this in your precious son.
announcement real quick. This week on Tuesday, we have our 50 plus lunch and learn. The time I'm mentioning is to let you know that we will be having screenings, health screenings, starting at 1030. Now, if you want to have a great time, come get some screenings. Uh, Lynette's done a great job in lining us a, a great person uh, to come and share. We have the Queen of Clubs coming, and I hope you'll come and, and be a part of that this week. Let us pray together. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace this day and forevermore. Amen.